is in them. So there are, there are some conservative and some contamination problems in some systems. But for the most part, the traces that we use, the environmental traces, those that we use for estimating groundwater ages, have been specifically chosen because they are conservative. And most of them, in many systems, behave conservatively and give us reliable groundwater ages. There are a number of different traces that can estimate groundwater ages, and I've only spoken today about, uh, to you about a few of them. But we actually have a whole suite of different traces, and they work over different time ranges. CFCs, for example, can date water from about five years old to about 50 years old, which is shown here. Carbon-14 from a couple of hundred up to about 20,000. They work over different ranges, which means that when someone rings me up and says, we want to do a study, we want to estimate the age of water, the first question I have to ask them is, well, how old's the water? Because to some extent, you need to know how old it is to know which method to use. But it's not too much of a problem. We usually know if the water's 10 years old, 100 years old, 1,000 years old. You'll also notice, though, there are some gaps in here. We have no readily available tracer that can date water from 50 to 200 years old. We can't measure age in that spectrum. There's another gap over here from where carbon-14 leaves us to before chlorine-36 comes in. There are a couple of traces that have been sort of proposed for filling those gaps, but for the most part we need very large, we need almost a petrol tanker full of water sometimes to make, a, to make an analysis. And, and they're also very expensive, so they're still root research tools rather than routinely available for us for solving hydrogeological problems. I think the role of traces in hydrogeology is changing a little bit. If you look back through the literature, a lot of the, the early work with these traces was done in, in remote areas, and they were used as a reconnaissance tool. Because when you think about it, before we had GPSs, even just surveying the bores to do a potentiometric surface map in Central Africa, or in remote areas, was actually a really difficult thing to do. And so traces were often used in some of these remote environments for getting a, an idea of how the system behaved with a minimal amount of effort. Where we interpreted traces quantitatively, it was usually with these highly idealised rectangular aquifer, triangular aquifer models. Today, I think there's a bigger role for traces when used in conjunction with hydraulics for trying to understand systems more thoroughly and get a better picture, a more accurate picture of, of how the system's behaving, particularly in heterogeneous systems. Despite the importance of traces, but, but despite what I've told you about the importance of traces, and there has been increasing use of traces, it's still largely in the research area. The use of traces is increasing only very slowly. I think there's some reason for that. I think one of our great failings as hydrogeologists is that we don't do uncertainty analysis very often. Or when we do it, we don't do it very well. On the few occasions where people have done model post audits, which means someone's done a model, made some predictions about what's going to happen, and then someone else has gone back 10 years later, had a look at the predictions, had a look at what happened. There's usually a bit of difference between the two. We know our models are not accurate, but, but we're still for the most part, there's a lot of good research happening in, in, in sensitivity analysis, but it's not widely used outside research areas. And if you don't do a sensitivity analysis, you don't know how accurate or inaccurate your model is. If you don't know how accurate your model prediction is, there's actually no incentive for trying to look for new or different ways or better ways to improve your model fit. If you don't know your model fits bad, you're not going to look for new techniques, new tools for, for, for improving that. And I think that's one of the issues with the lack of adoption of not just traces, but with a lot of tools in hydrogeology that aren't seeing widespread application. So just to conclude, in homogeneous aquifers, OK, we can use hydraulics, we can do Darcy's law calculations to estimate fluxes. We can also use traces. And in homogeneous systems, they both give us the same results. But we know there aren't many homogeneous aquifers. In heterogeneous systems, traces have an advantage when we want to know about average flow rates because they have a very large spatial footprint. And I've said in sort of in moderately heterogeneous aquifers, we can really benefit if we combine 
traces and we combine hydraulics, we can get a much better, ac a much better representation of the flow system and a much more accurate prediction. And we can do that now inside our groundwater models. Groundwater models can calculate ages. We can use them in conjunction with heads, in conjunction with hydraulic conductivity estimates to calibrate our models. In highly heterogeneous systems, systems like the fractured rocks I've talked about, the uncertainty is so, of the hydraulic approaches is so high, we can't characterise these systems hydraulically. And we need to look for, for new methods, innovative method, methods to try and understand these systems. And I think in this area, environmental traces, also a lot of other tools, have some promise. We, ha we haven't nailed environmental traces in fractured rocks in heterogeneous systems by any means. But I think that the uncertainty of hydraulics, the uncertainty of hydraulic connectivity in these environments mean that they perhaps have, have more promise and perhaps environmental traces give us some hope that we might be able to characterise these systems. Thank you very much.